for children's and young adult books. Just shout out the various different types of diverse groups that you see as uh, part of that audience. Cultural diversity. Cultural diversity. Uh, disability or ability. Mm -hmm. What else do you see? LGBT. LGBT. Gender, as in uh, increase of, of, uh, of all. Oh, class. Class. Uh, Socioeconomic status, and then also legal status, as in documented or not. Um, Religion. <laughs> Political um, views. Body structure. Um, yep. Yep. Adoption. Any others? There's, there's different types of families. Yeah, there, there, are, there are so many, so many people out there um, who either see or don't see themselves, or others, other folks who don't actually experience stories about people in all of these diverse groups. Uh, back in 1996, Emily Style wrote, ideally. The curriculum provides each student with both windows out onto the experience of, uh, experiences of others and mirrors of her or his own reality and validity. But for most students, the present curriculum provides many windows and few mirrors. Well, she was writing about curriculum, but I suspect that's true of our collections. Maybe it's a little less true than it used to be, but in my experience, it's, it's very true. Um, the we need diverse a books movement started um, just about a little over a year ago, Sona, I think. Yeah, it started, I think it probably was like April, May, 2014. And Sona is with us. Can you introduce yourself? I'm Sona. I'm an author and a member of the We Need Diverse Books team. If you guys have questions, please ask, and I have bookmarks. <laughs> and around that same time, Ellen O um, prompted folks to respond to we need diverse books because, and some of you who saw the video earlier will see a few of those responses, and I, I was really moved by some of those responses. Um, some kids responded, so we can see other people. Because the world is diverse, because we all deserve heroes, because books remind us that we're not alone, because there's nothing like finding a long lost twin in a book, so I will not feel left out, because I myself am more than my culture, because the world is bigger than my own experiences, because I already know my story and I want to know yours, because the leaders of tomorrow need to see themselves represented in the books of today. And so tonight we're talking about the diverse books movement. We're talking about why children need to see a variety of different experiences in the books that they look at. Uh, and we're also talking about our role and how we can work together with other partners who care about children, who care about books, to raise awareness and increase the options for all children in terms of both windows and mirrors. Um, Roxanne, who is going to arrive any minute, any minute, any minute, and I, before we got started here, actually asked folks outside of, of our, our honored guests to, to share their opinions on this. And we had a few really fabulous responses. And I want to share first with you Andrew Medlar, who is the current president of OSC. Hi, everybody. I'm Andrew Medlar, president of the Association for Library Service to Children, a division of the American Library Association. In OSC, our mission is creating a better future for children through libraries. To do that, we need diverse books. And to do that, we need, we need diverse books. This is a future in which we will all be living that is even more vibrantly diverse than the one we have today. And because of this, kids need those proverbial windows and mirrors that books, in whatever format they come, can provide for them. Just as libraries transform communities, these books really do transform lives. The work that We Need Diverse Books is doing to foster the creation and publication of all these titles is vital and a perfect complement to the work that we're doing in libraries because libraries will buy these books 
and there's room on our shelves and in the arms of kids for all of these great diverse books. ALSC is working on diversity every single day through our Diversity in Action initiative, which connects kids and families with diverse languages and books, through our white paper position on the importance of diversity in library collections and services, and through all the amazing diverse titles that we put gold and silver stickers on every year. We're all in this together. We all need diverse books. Bonds from author Lisa Yee. Hi, I'm Lisa Yi. Um, I wrote a book called Stanford Wong Flunks Big Time about this Chinese-American basketball player who's flunking a class. And yes, it is true that not all Asian students are A students. But anyway, so I do a lot of school visits and I was in Chicago one time and, and there was this boy who stood up and he had blonde hair and blue eyes and he, he, was, he was clutching Stanford's book. And he said to me, I've never finished a book before but I finished yours because I loved it because Stanford is exactly like me. And I realized that he didn't identify with Stanford's race, he identified with Stanford as a person. And to be a good author, I believe that the impetus must come from within. An author must write a story that is honest and engaging and compelling. You know, it's not good storytelling to lead with social issues. You instead, you lead with a well-rounded character and see where that takes you. If you can do that, and when that happens, when you engage the reader, a bond is drawn and an understanding of the character's race or ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, that will follow. We need diverse books. And then lastly, we have um, editor-at-large at Disney Hyperion, Stephanie Lurie. I'm Stephanie Lurie at Disney Hyperion, and I'm very glad that we have the We Need Diverse Books campaign because we do need to look at this. I've experienced career highs, like taking over the Jump at the Sun imprint at Disney Hyperion, which is dedicated to the African American experience, to lows like being in a meeting where a sales director said, we can't put African Americans on the cover of a book if you don't want to impede sales. But a question that I struggle with as an editor, as a white person, do we not mention race in our characters so that every reader can stand in the shoes of the main character? Or does that just encourage myopia? Should race be mentioned as much as possible? It's something that we all think about. We also make sure our books are as universal as possible. It's often why you see animal characters in picture books. Sometimes our books are strictly about another culture, like Sold with Patricia McCormick. And even in our commercial fiction, like series by Rick Riordan, we have a whole cast of diverse characters. I do think that it is about changing family values in the end, that we really have to have consumers on board too. So good luck with your discussions. Thanks. I'm Janet Wong. Thank you, Joyce Valenza, for asking me to talk about We Need Diverse Books. We do need diverse books, but when I first heard about the movement, I was a little defensive. My first thought was, wait, we have diverse books. We've had diverse books for decades. Ashley Bryan, Alma Florada, Pat Mora, Joseph Bruchak, Linda Sue Park. We've had diverse books, but there is a problem. Take a look at the notable books for a global society list. There are 20 years of NBGS lists, 1996 to 2015. On the 1996 list, you'll find Christopher Paul Curtis, Rita Williams Garcia, Virginia Hamilton, and Naomi Shihab Nye and Jacqueline Woodson, two of the authors who were also on last year's 2015 list. Look for diversity in non-obvious places. Poetry anthologies are a great place to find diversity. Share diversity by reading aloud. A lot of you have said, 
my kids don't want to read diversity. Okay, no problem. Read diverse books to them. Imagine this book being read to 300,000 children on the same day. Tremendous because it's a great book, and even more tremendous because it's a great diverse and inclusive book. Thank you for listening and working together on this important topic. We do need diverse books, but even more than that, we need advocates for diverse books, people like you. Thanks. It's kind of unnerving and looking up at a giant blown up version of your own face. Yeah, I like the soundtrack. Did you like it? Yes, I did. So let me introduce our esteemed and diverse panel. Um, Mark Aronson is a friend of mine, and he will be moderating the panel. Mark has worked as an editor and a publisher of books for children and teenagers for over 25 years. At Holt, he created Edge, the first imprint devoted to international and multicultural books for teenagers. His own award-winning books often attempt to link US and world history and to explore issues such as the history of the idea of race. He's an assistant teaching professor at Rutgers. His next book will be his second collaboration with his wife, Marina Boathouse. I never said her name. Boathouse. Boathouse, thank you, sorry. And it, it will be called The Eyes of the World, How Robert, Robert Kappa and Gerda Taro invited, it Invented Modern Photojournalism. Forgive any of my missteps there, Mark. And Mark is going to introduce our panel. Thank you. Uh, I will now introduce the panel and then Oh, we'll but wait, Mark, first. If you are tweeting this, don't forget the hashtags. It is hashtag LIS502 and hashtag iSchoolRU. And very sorry, Mark. No worries. So I will introduce our panel, including the two, and I hope soon only one, missing members. Uh, so to my immediate left is Shelly Diaz, who has worked in several areas of children's publishing, from licensing to book scouting. She was the co-editor of Caridad Ferrar's So She Dances and Gloria Whelan's The Disappeared. Currently, she is senior editor for reviews at SLJ. She has an MLIS from Queens College and is the editor of the SLJ Teen Newsletter. She edits book reviews, conducts author interviews, and writes news articles on diversity issues. She can be found tweeting about books, TV shows, and movies at SDiaz101. Uh, to her immediate left is, I think you may know, Janet Wong, is a uh, DJ of video, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, video extravaganzas, now is a former lawyer who switched careers and became a children's poet. She has been featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show, CNN's Paul Zahn Show, and Radical Sabbatical. Author of 30 children's books on writing, dumpster diving, diversity, chess, and more. Janet is a frequent speaker at schools and conferences. She is also the program chair of the ILA Literacy and Social Responsibility uh, SIG, and past chair of the Notable Books for a Global Society Committee. Her company, Pomelo Books, has published 700 or more poems by uh, more than 150 poets, representing a wide spectrum of backgrounds and experiences. And to her left is Stacey Barney, who is a senior editor at Penguin Putnam. She acquires middle grade, young adult, and select nonfiction and picture books. Most recently, she edited the 2015 Coretta Scott King Illustrator Award winning Firebird by Misty Copeland and Christopher Myers, as well as The Wrath on the Dawn, a sumptuous retelling of Arabian Nights by debut author Renee Ahdia. Stacy also has the pleasure of editing Kristen Levine, The Lions of Little Rock, Tara Sullivan, Golden Boy, which you were just sharing, and Sheila O'Connor, Sparrow Road. Presently, Stacy is excited about a German translation titled You Can't See the Elephants, which has already garnered two star reviews and is an international award winner, which is making its American debut, and Stacy has agreed to speak 
to the International Children's Book class in spring. So you'll get to meet her again if you're taking that uh, class. Uh, newly arrived <laughs> is uh, uh, Roxanne Feldman has been a children's and middle school librarian for more than two decades in New York City. She originally hails from Taiwan and obtained her master's degree in children's literature from Simmons College in Boston. For the past 20 years, Roxanne has served on many committees, including the Newbery, Best Fiction for Young Adults, and Notable Children's Books, and others such as the Asian Pacific American Literary Award. She records her reading notes and thoughts on children's and YA literature at Ferrosa Cyber Library, which is Ferrosa, like fairrosa.com. And so she will add her perspective. Unfortunately, my wife, Marina Budos, could not be here. Um, but she writes both uh, children's, I mean, young adult and adult fiction and nonfiction. In particular, uh, Ask Me No Questions, which was written from the point of view of the Bangladeshi family uh, that was undocumented after 9-11. And she's currently writing about the issue of Muslim surveillance through the uh, surveillance of Muslim communities. Uh, but in the form of a particular character, a boy. And so I can tell you a little bit from her experience if that arises. So this is our panel. You have many perspectives here. Um, what I thought I would do is just have a little bit of a beginning PowerPoint, taking off from some of what you've heard already. Uh, see if that prompts some questions for you guys to discuss, or if you want to take things in different dis directions, and then open up uh, for discussion. So. So this is, yes, you've been introduced to We Need Diverse Books. You should explore their website, which has many resources. And this is the basic infographic uh, that actually Roxanne was good enough to show me. And the argument here is that over decades and decades, the percentage of uh, children's books by or about people of color. And using that as a definition of diversity, we've all expanded the terminology, but using just that uh, has remained uh, not only about the same, but at a ludicrous level. Um, here's another um, chart that then breaks these uh, numbers down a little bit more into four different groups and looks at the question of to what extent are there books about these areas? And to what extent do the people from these groups write these books? Um, and uh, yet another question, which of course might come up, is you might be of any background on your census form or in your own self-definition, but you might write a math textbook. In other words, it's not just a question of who's writing, but about what. And at what place does who you are have some bearing on what you're writing or how we should see it. So um, to me, there are two questions here. One is, or a series of questions, how many included, how many were by, and then a related question which comes up directly on the We Need Diverse book site, how many were acquired or edited by uh, people of color. Again, using that as the marker, we can expand the, the terminology. So to me, there are at least five different questions. What gets into books? Who puts it there? Who edits it? Who buys it? And who reads it? Because even though all of these may be related, they're not the same questions. And as we look at diversity, it seems to me we need to look at all of these questions because no one of them answers the others. So this is the mission statement of We Need Diverse Books, which you can read quickly. I don't believe in reading slides. Um, I, I don't believe in the speaker reading slides. <laughs> and, and then... Uh, uh, and then it, sort of the question that I would like to ponder is what, which essential changes and what do you mean by the publishing industry? Do you mean the industry that publishes books or do you mean the industry from which come books? Which are, again, 
not identical. So, this other question that I would ask, and Sonia and I were just talking about it, is the picture, what exactly do those stats record? Uh, many of you are students who study information. What information was contained in that chart? My own personal view is that nonfiction is underrepresented in all of the questions <laughs> about diversity, and, and that that needs to be explored. Uh, this is, are the three key uh, ideas or causes or um, rationales on the We Need Diverse site. We need diverse book site, and I think they're all well worth considering in discussion. Uh, this also found on the We Need Diverse book site, I hope you will all look at it, is a white paper from ALA that specifically links everything we've talked about so far with librarians and what librarians can do. So there's a real hook here, a lot of rich information. But then issues come up, and these are some of the cross-current issues that you hear in the field as this issue comes up. Is, is, is it required to be from a group to write about that, and who gets to decide that? And that then adds a whole other voice to this, which is not just who writes, who produces, who buys, who edits, but who reviews, and whose reviews carry weight and why. And that is yet another factor that we have to weave into this because there are inclusive definitions of diversity and there are more possessive, I would define, someone may prefer a different word, uh, definitions of, differ, of diversity. And I would actually just say one other thing here. To me it is a valid goal to increase the opportunity for more people from previously more marginalized groups to have a say. That is a valid goal. That is a different goal from talking about having more books that have more kinds of people in them. Those are two different goals, and I think they have to be discussed differently. Um, and so now to bring up a couple of questions. Who winds up writing books for children and teenagers? Uh, Janet gave an interesting story that when she started out, her very marvelous, experienced, savvy editor sort of sagely shook her said and head and said, Janet, the problem is you actually want to make money from, have, make a living from writing children's books. Uh, and that the pool of people who can do that is limited, because children's books do not pay very much. And so you have to be able to afford to be a children's or young adult author. So, one thing that I admire in, in the We Need Diverse Books movement, it is actively involved in outreach, seeking to find new talented creators who want to enter the field and have the skill and perhaps need mentoring and need connections, but have something to say. And then the second area, and again, perhaps Stacy, you will have most to say about this, is the question of who winds up working in publishing, which basically means you have to have a, a college degree and be able to live in New York and not make much money. That again limits the pool of the people who are willing or able to do this. Okay, so I will finish up by saying that um, We Need Diverse Books has done some marvelous work with finding internships to bring more people into publishing. So that's the framework I've had my say. Uh, these are the questions I have. I will turn it over to you, Shelley, and see how you see it. And just the one last thing is the great thing you can do is build audience. That's a place where I see a direct role for all of you. Sure. Um, so I'm Shelly Diaz, as you can see from my little play card. And um, just to answer, or at least <coughs> attempt to answer some of the questions that Mark mentioned, 
Um, you know, I started out working in publishing, and it really is a lot about who you know and, um, and how you can get in the door. And for the most part, most publishers try to attract Ivy Leagues, you know, students, and um, a lot of times it's, you know, resumes go around of, you know, my friend's daughter is graduating from such and such school, here's a resume kind of thing. Um, and, I, and I feel that there is a need for being able to work or look beyond that. And also, a big thing that publishing needs to do, which I really doubt might happen in our lifetime, is actually pay a living wage and salary. Um, and because when I started out, I think it was in the late 20s, and it hasn't improved that much. So to be able to live in New York on that type of salary, other than the fact, let's say like I did, I lived with my parent, my mom for a very, very long time, and that's the only reason why I was able to afford to work in publishing, or if you had a disposable income money, like a family that has actual money. So if publishing really wants to get diverse editors and, and people working within the field, then they have to be able to pay a living salary, which I don't know if people are willing to do that. Uh, but you librarians and can do a lot by showing and purchasing uh, books, diverse books, those that are already out there, because uh, people in publishing like to say that diversity doesn't sell, which is a big lie, because if you don't create diverse books, then diverse books cannot sell. And um, what we need to do is show them with our purchasing power, which is what librarians have, is that these books do sell. And, um, and you can do that by, uh, by purchasing those books and also incorporating diverse books within your book displays. And I don't know if my PowerPoint is up. Yes, it is. OK, great. So these are just quick ways um, to include diverse books within your libraries. And, and you can incorporate them with book displays. Uh, for example, during Halloween, there, there's one of my favorite titles from a few years ago, Zombie Baseball Beatdown by Paolo Bacigalupi. And this is an awesome book about three 10 to 12 year old friends who discover that their town are there's the, some killer zombie cows. And they're about to make everybody in the town a zombie. And they just so happen to be Indian American, Mexican American. One of the friends, his family is undocumented. But that's not the point. The point is, this is a really cool zombie book that you can put in your Halloween display. There are books about for Bullying Prevention Month. You can have displays for back to school, library orientation. We don't have to continuously use the same books over and over again. We can incorporate diverse books within those displays. Um, I have here a book for Independence Day, one of Janet's books, Apple Pie, 4th of July, right there. And there's so many different ways you can do that. Also, the book talks, which is what we did um, outside, is to not focus on how diverse a book is, because that's as if you're trying to convince a kid that spinach, you should eat it because it's good for you. No kid is going to believe that. So um, the same way, as we mentioned outside, that you should focus on the fun parts of the book when you're doing a book talk, talk for example. Um, the Inquisitor's Apprentice is a perfect a, a real life for Harry Potter fans. And the main character just happens to be Jewish. And there's a Percy Jackson, for Percy Jackson fans, we have the Savage Fortress, and the main character happens to be Indian. So there are all these different real life, so popular books that you can easily include in your book talks. And moving right along um, with story times, you can have superhero themed story times with Nino Wrestles the World, which is one of my ultimate favorite books. And you can have a math themed story time with Round is a Moon Cake. Explore geometry, uh, and there's different uh, Chinese cultural information within that book, but it just happens to be a really great read aloud. And, um, and if you're a school librarian and, and you're always looking for those curriculum connections, there are plenty of books out there, um, web fiction and nonfiction, um, exploring different uh, curriculum aspects like Columbus Day, which we all know is full of um, different 
perspectives that we can um, talk about in, in the classroom. And you as a librarian, you have a lot of say, a lot of power, and your kids have a lot of say, a lot of power, and talk to the publishers, communicate to them, let them know what your community needs so that we can have a collection full, instead of um, pretty white girls on, in dresses on every single cover, we can have a nice display of diverse books. transmedia and it was sort of occupying two-thirds of my brain when I put this slideshow together. So let's see where we go. Transmedia processes show that there is always more we can learn about the characters and their world. So transmedia is just books plus. Books plus. It's, it's not um, the same old material in different um, in different media, it's, um, it's each time you, you go out to a different medium, you have more stuff that's added. So um, always show us that there's always more we can learn about the characters and their world. And I think that this is so, so crucial idea in the We Need Diverse Books. One of my fears with the We Need Diverse Books general conversations is that um, people are being reduced, I fear, to their race or ethnicity, or whatever it is that, that uh, identifies them primarily. And I want to say, yeah, OK, well, we're that, but I'm a potato chip eater. You know, that's my culture, the culture of salt and oil. Well, um, <laughs> this is, so my first 20, how many years have I been doing this now? I've been doing this for 24 years. My first 21 books were published by big publishers, Simon & Schuster, FSG, um, Candlewick, um, Harcourt. Then, all of a sudden, I started wanting to do my own books. So I've become a publisher. And when it came time to do my own books, one of the things that, uh, that, that, that really informed the kind of things that we publish was my uh, very practical upbringing. I learned to read because I had to read Medicare statements because I had to read letters from Social Security, because I had to call the IRS. That was my early literacy uh, training. So usefulness and also um, something that my grandfather's girlfriend told me when my first book came out had poems about racism, poems about um, shame, poems about uh, Asians and their obsession with straight A's. And my grandfather's girlfriend, Korean, my, I'm half Chinese, half Korean, my grandfather that I'm talking about is Chinese. His girlfriend was Korean. And he would say, oh, she puts kimchi on the table every night. And I'm thinking, yeah, well, you know, she's been doing that her whole life. She became your girlfriend anyway. Well, anyway, <laughs> she, she said to me when, when I handed them my first book, she said, after she read it, she said, can you be happy, more happy? And I realized, oh, she didn't want me airing all the dirty laundry, you know, the racism, right? She wanted happy. So, so when we published this, I was thinking, okay, I want some happy. I want some happy. So we have um, celebration poems from all different cultures. Um, some people wrote outside their culture. Margarita Engel, uh, who's uh, German and Cuban, decided to write about Nepal because her son-in-law is Nepalese, is from Nepal. So uh, I have some things to talk about that. Um, oops. Where did it go? OK, poem movies, that's one kind of transmedia. And it's a great opportunity for uh, people to insert diversity into whatever text. Transmedia makes a text grow. It can go in any direction that you want. What if our students created diverse and inclusive transmedia projects to diversify our favorite non-diverse titles? So I'm saying, all right, we're complaining that this isn't diverse, that isn't diverse. Take it. And then say to, to your students, to your patrons, to your book club, all right, now how can we write deleted scenes for this that, that 
that involve that star diverse characters, all right? How can we do a prequel to this? Use fan fiction, for instance. Okay, fan fiction. Oh, that's so good that it went into that. I didn't even know it would go there. All right, so fan fiction. In transmedia, there's something powerful, powerful, about how the reader is incited to search out dispersed content and reassemble it into a meaningful mental model. Let's give kids that power. Thanks. perspective of this. I work at Penguin Random House. Um, I have recently started referring to myself as a unicorn. A woman at uh, Simon Schuster wrote a really wonderful blog on uh, the CBC diversity uh, page about meeting Edwige Dantecott at the Brooklyn Book Festival and introducing herself and saying that she was in marketing at Simon Schuster and Edwige said to her, oh, so you're a unicorn. Um, and I just, I, I love that. And I, on the editorial side, I position people who have the power to buy books. I am one of four. Eight, one, two, yeah, four. <laughs> four of us who are African American um, in the industry. I'm the only African American editor at Penguin Random House. Um, on the children's side, I should say. Um, industry wide, there are probably three Asian African editors. Um, and two Indian, and I believe, and one Hispanic that I know of, which is a little undercover. Um, and like, my numbers may not be absolutely accurate, but that's that's about the size of the thing. There are probably a hundred plus editors on the children's book side running around in New York City, and um, the diversity of, of the acquisition editors. I can count in less than 10 fingers. Um, so that is one part of the conversation. Um, but it doesn't end there because just because someone may not be from a particular culture doesn't mean that they're not interested in acquiring books that represent different diversities, different cultures, different ethnicities, LGBT. I work with really wonderful, wonderful people who are interested in all of that. Um, from my perspective, the rub comes from the merging of career ambition and goals. Because I think what people forget is that editors have a career track, just like authors do. So when we acquire a book, we're really not just thinking about that author's career. Sure, we're thinking about that author's career. Let's say 70% is thinking about that author's career. Another 30 is thinking about our own career and how this will contribute to our list and how we're contributing to the bottom line of our company because publishing is a business. You have to be making money to keep your standing as someone who is acquiring books for a publishing house. Um, so I actually think that we need to shift some of the thinking about like who works in publishing and who acquires books and who edits books because the truth of the matter is People would acquire, well, let's put it this way, people acquire what they know their house can sell. And that doesn't necessarily mean that people won't buy certain books or there's not interest in certain books, but where some houses are good at some things and not so good at other things. I turn down books all the time and they're like, well, this isn't really what we do here. This is maybe a little bit more academic. Oh, we don't, I'm sorry, Mark, we don't do a lot of nonfiction. You know. <laughs> We want to acquire what we know will be successful. And unfortunately, given our market, um, a lot of what is successful is, are the kinds of books that you get, you know, pretty white girl with a dress slapped on the cover. That's just the size of it. Um, so I would like to see more diversity, not only in cultural, but of experience of people in other departments. Because once I edit a book, I hand it over to sales and marketing and publicity. I'm not at the account um, uh, conversations with my sales reps who are sort of saying, oh, you must buy this book. I do a launch presentation, when, so for 
when we when I quiet this book and the author and I were done editing it, we had an in-house launch, and that means I then have to make a presentation to my sales force, my marketing team, my publicity team, and I tell them why I bought a book and why I think that somebody is going to want to read this book, and that inspires them and transfers into their conversations that they will then have with Barnes and Nobles or Amazon or the Indies. I'm not there for those conversations. So, that, but that's, that's my job is to give them the tools that they will need to impart what I was thinking when I, when I acquired the book to them. And then in turn, that bookseller will then talk to people coming into the store. And a lot of the times, the, the way that I position and phrase uh, how, how or why I acquired something will make it down to the consumer because I'm sort of packaging it for people to understand why this book is important, why people should read this book. Um, but it would be nice to have people who look differently or come from different businesses um, to be in other departments to also sort of shape the conversation about, um, about any book, but particularly books from, uh, diverse, that represent diversity. Um, so where am I going to go? This is a problem I'm not having power my I actually think that was a very good point and under discussed about diversity in, in design, marketing, sales, mm -hmm. all of and, and how what that might contribute to the mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say one um, okay. <laughs> um, I'll say one last thing. The reason that I do harp on diversity of experience as well um, is because this is a second career for me. I was a teacher for several years before I got into book publishing. Um, so the question of living wage was actually less of an issue for me and more of an issue for me at the same time because I love teaching and not to say the teachers are not underpaid because they are, but I'm a single person with two cats, you know, and they pay based on, um, you know, credits that she thought I had that when I had two master's degrees. It was making a nice living. I had no complaints. Um, and then I got the publishing bug and I came back to New York City. I'm from New York City, so that was an easy move to make than it might otherwise be. And I started with FSG, and the um, publisher in hiring me said, you do realize we're going to pay you nothing. And I said, yep, yep, I heard, I heard. Um, and I had already arranged for myself to be teaching at night. So I taught at Matthew Evers, and I taught at Kings for a while. I was an editorial assistant, kind of um, making my bones in publishing. And so moving up the ranks was an urgent thing for me because I had grown up bills by that time. And I didn't want to be working three jobs for the rest of my life. Um, but I appreciated the apprenticeship model. And publishing is an apprenticeship business. And I think that that needs to happen. You need to work under somebody who's been doing it for a really long time. And in, in my experience, it never meant getting somebody's coffee. I was really learning substantive things um, that, um, and learning the, how to publish a book and the philosophies of the publishing that I still adhere to. Um, so I think that that process and being someone's assistant is, is very, very important. And sometimes you do need to do it for three, four, five years. Um, it's, you know, I, I say to people who are newly into the industry, as long as you're in a position and you don't feel like you're banging your head against the wall and you're always learning something new and you feel like you're progressing, you should probably stick where you are. You shouldn't let money dictate um, what you're going to do career-wise because this is not the industry to do that in. It's not necessarily about the living wage and what we're paying assistance, what have you. The whole industry, we're designed, we're set up not to make any money. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes some of the things that we do to sell books or not sell books are like, well, why don't they do that? And the answer is, they've always done it this way. Yeah. Oh, oh, like, oh, like, okay, then. And <laughs> <laughs> books are returnable. I don't understand. Um, but you, if you're entering this industry, it's sort of, it's kind of like, yeah, and that's just, yeah. So it would be nice if you paid a living wage. But it's sort of like you kind of have to understand you're going into media, you're going into the low end 
of media, you're not going into film, you're not going into TV, you're going into books. And unfortunately, given the way our society values books on the, on the media scale, um, you're just, it's going to be a low profit business. So, you know, you're not doing it for the love of the money. Okay, I'm Roxanne. Um, as you heard, um, Mark said that I came here to study children's lit. I got a master's degree in children's lit. So 25 years ago, I told myself, you know, I was going to be a children's book editor as a natural next step. And I feel like I'm going to do a lot of confessions tonight. The first confession is I still want to be an editor, um, but I also have learned through all these years kind of working alongside all my publishing colleagues. And I did work in Macmillan many years ago as a subsidiary rights assistant, and I never quite made it to the editorial side. Um, that it really takes a lot of talent, a lot of fortitude, just a lot of, a lot of stuff in order to become a really successful editor. And I'm not quite sure I have what it takes to be an editor, oh, but it's still my first confession. <laughs> what if I did become an editor, though, and I'm asking myself today? Um, would I have been a major industry leader, being Asian, or now I consider myself Asian American, even though when I was growing up, I was completely in the majority, because I grew up in Taiwan where everybody looked or somewhat like me, they were taller. I'm still yeah. short from a Taiwanese standard, okay? Um, so I never quite felt the same kind of things that my students might feel. I, I, I deal with a lot of um, um, Asian American students in my school, and I don't think they have the same experience that I had because I grew up as a majority. I never had to struggle with my identity. So I wonder, um, would I have been a major industry leader and what would that have meant for the books I edit, if I do edit, and what would they look like out there on the market? And my second confession is, I don't think I would have the kind of courage or even knowledge to really make a huge change in the industry. Because like you just said, the industry is a very traditional industry. There's a lot of mentoring, there's a lot of these are the qualities I've been looking for, right? And because I study at Simmons College about children's literature, mostly Western children's literature, um, that I learned a set of ways to look at books, which I've only recently started to um, challenge after I went to China and looked at the newest Chinese children's books and what they are trying to do. And my first instinct said, that's no good. It's not going to sell. You won't be able to sell this in America because there's not enough for storyline. And then I say, oh, I taught, I've been taught that a picture book must have a particular, you know, progression. And I say, is that really like the only way to look at a picture book? And I say, but for the Chinese readers, obviously something that's philosophical, that is not as plot driven that's still good enough for children, or even actually more desirable because it's more philosophical. So why am I rejecting that? Because I rejected it because I've been looking at picture books the same way as everybody else in America for the last century, right? So I think if I were an editor, my, my confession is, I don't know that I would have been um, that great at promoting diversity, at least not until recently. Um, and I think I maybe probably have been one of the many who I kind of maybe put in a few books because of my diverse background. And I say, you did well. You put something of color, you different colors, um, onto the tapestry of children's literature. But I'm not sure that I would be so courageous. And that led to my third confession is, even if I haven't been an editor and I have been a children's and, and um, school librarian working with um, like nine year old to 18 year old with a pretty diverse um, group of students. Um, I don't think I ever quite took diversity seriously until really, really recently. 
um, many reasons for why I started to take it seriously. But I bought diverse books, I did diverse book talks, I put display up, um, but I felt like I was doing it because it's my job. You know, I work in a school, it's a library, and we're being taught, you're, you're listening to us saying, you are the front, you know, like, um, on the ground, um, working with children, it's your job to promote diverse books. And that's always what I believed in, but I also always believed in something slightly different. I kind of believed in the great literature transcends. So it really doesn't matter whether you know you see yourself in the books or not, skin colors or whatever your diverse, different diversity you know uh, factors. Um, I I think I always kind of value the uh, if you talk about windows and mirrors, I tend to value the windows more. In some way, I feel like books are there to take you to see other things, not necessarily to see yourself. And when you see other things, because if the book addresses humanities as a whole in a really, really wonderful way, you will reflect on, upon yourself. But recently, I was thinking, no, that is actually not true. Um, I learned that unless I change what I truly believe in, all these diversity things that I've been doing is just window dressing. I think it's a sham if I don't actually truly believe that it is crucial, it's actually essential and crucial for all my students, white, black, Asian, Latino, all of them, to be immersed in a wall. The entire library should be as diverse as possible. Right? Um, um, you know, I truly believe that it's crucial because we're having so many diversity discussions at school. And I say, I can't be the one who perpetuates the status quo if I don't want my students to perpetuate the status quo. If I don't keep giving them books that look like this, or that look like this, or look at your books, um, all they're going to see around them are the same old, same old. And they're never going to learn to look at different things, or, you know, like having different... I, I want to challenge them to actually consider the world they live in and challenge them to look at the, the literature and to really consider the literature that they need. So I just started learning about how to do all of this just really recently. And I'm the librarian on this panel right now, um, and you're a library, librarian student. And I really think if you don't change your own mind, if you don't truly believe in it, no matter how much you're doing it, it's not going to make a real difference in the world. So my challenge to you is to really read a lot about the diverse books that a lot of people talk about. And there's so many different diverse opinions. You know, Mark and I never almost saw eye to eye on many things. And I don't really like the this is how you should do it kind of a model. And I really believe in, if you truly believe in something, you will find the right way to promote the books that you need to promote, to really present the books that your students or your library patrons really need. Um, so that seems very philosophical, but, but no, it's actually really practical. Um, and read as much as you can about other people's opinions. Um, and I have a lot to say about who can write what, and, and I change my mind every day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roxanne, that was really inspiring, except I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> I was because, uh, be, because, I mean, it is inspiring and great, and it's, it's really interesting to hear your ideas develop, but I do think there is literature that's transcendent. Oh, that's and, and if there is literature that's transcendent, whoever the characters are that are in it, or whoever writes it, I do think we have to keep a place for finding books not, that may not, on the surface, seem to be diverse, because we say there is something in it that tells any reader he or she is touched at a certain level of depth or wit 
or information that it, that it takes you out of yourself. And so it seems to me that's valuable, even though it is also valuable to make it a, a given and a crucial. But if you're excluding that and saying, no, that, that, that was an, a cop-out, that was an excuse, that would, and that we really need to fill our shelves with diversity, even if we therefore do not give kids access to books that we ourselves, not some canon, but we ourselves believe offer transcendence, I, I don't think that's fair to, to, to young people. I agree, I agree with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is to say that covering your library walls with diverse books isn't giving access to children to literature that transcends? I mean, I think we, as Roxanne pointed out, that for hundreds of years we've all used the same lens as to what is great literature. And I think we all are in a position where we can really examine that, like what is that lens, and recognize our own privileges. You know, each of us have the privileges that we, and biases that we bring to every book that we read. So me, as a college educated, you know, multiple degrees reader, I'm going to bring a certain bias and a certain lens to a book that I read, but a kid who, who has not, or, or even an adult, because I think that's the power of the We Need Diverse Books movement, that it's, being, it's not only children's literature now, it's affecting all, um, all art at this point and media. But um, anyway, you know, we, we have to understand our own biases and our own privileges when we look at books. And, and kind of not go by the usual, well, this is great literature because it adheres to, you know, to Dickens or Austen or, or Franzen or, you know, all these people. But meanwhile, there are all these cultures that have great literature that we're never exposed to because they're not at the level of, of all those authors that I mentioned. Else want to join in the fray? <laughs> I can keep. I can keep talking. But I don't Go ahead. Part of it. No, I'm just thinking. Like, I mean, part of part of my learning right now. I think I'm only at the beginning of learning this whole new way of thinking. Is to, like I said, read a lot of diverse and opposing viewpoints, and don't feel like you need to jump in and really side with one or the other right away. Um, look at the whole picture. You know, recently, Michael Grant, who is a YA novelist uh, and adult and children, whatever, and he's been very vocal about like, you know, if he, if it was there was a white author who basically say white author should only write for white, you know, from the white perspective. So everybody should only write from their perspective, just in case, first of all, like if you miss, you know, represent also. She's proposing that there should be more people working in the industry, and there's so few um, people of color writers that she wants to not take away that market share. And Michael Grant jumped in and said, like, but then you're only you're saying like the Latinos can only have 13 percent of um, the pie, and so you're limiting their opportunities. And at first, when I saw his article, I said, he's right. You know, you shouldn't limit them yourself. And I said. But if it's from 0.2% to 13%, that's 20, that's, that's a lot of, you know, it's a huge jump. It's like, if it's 1% of Latino working in the industry, and we say now you can have 13% of the pie. But like, that's, again... No, I'm just saying, like, I was thinking about that, right? And I said, I still haven't decided uh, either way. I just think looking at the whole picture is really important. Um, when I, when I work with a lot of um, librarians, whether they're veteran librarians or young librarians newly in the industry, a lot of people don't actually understand how, how um, the publishing industry works. And I think that is something that we need to keep pushing to, for people to understand how everything works. So that this perspective is great from so many different people actually talking about how the industry works. And I totally agree with you, the sales force is really need to be diversified. I mean, it's also, 
the stats are an interesting thing to consider from my perspective because I don't require by stats. You know, a, an agent knows me and knows that I like a certain thing, I like certain subject matter, what have you, and sends to me um, based on that. And as a unicorn, I've worked very hard to inform agents that I am, yes, very interested in African American culture, but I'm also interested in Indian culture. I'm also interested in Asian culture, Chinese. Like, it doesn't matter. But I'm most interested in really, really good writing and great characterization and story. So, yes, yeah, send me things that are diverse, but don't only send me things that are diverse. Um, you know, you don't, you don't want to be pigeonholed by statistics because you are one of the only African American editors you now must consider all. African American stories because I'm not necessarily going to like every single African American story that you mm -hmm. send my way. And that's, again, that's not how most editors acquire. They acquire based on what they want to work on for the next three or four years, what they're going to want to read over and over and over and over again and be just as passionate and enthusiastic about the day that they first read it versus two years after pub and they're still championing it. Um, to the question of who can write what, it also is a very baffling question to me because I think of stories and writers first. And it's the story and the writing that draws me in. So this is a book that takes place in Tanzania. It's about uh, the albino killings in Tanzania. Tara's a white lady, I love her. And I love her writing and that's what I fell in love with first. I don't believe that I shouldn't have acquired this book about African characters because the author was, was white. She got it right. She wrote this book beautifully and respectfully. And you know what? It still counts as diversity. And I, I would add that if we look at the two books recently that have really explored the story of segregation during World War II in the Army, was written by Tanya Lee Stone mm -hmm. and by Steve Shankin. Mm -hmm. And the point is, this was a subject that hadn't been covered, that two authors wanted to write about and brought to light. I, I just don't see how you can say there's anything wrong with that. Ideally, would it have been great or wonderful or terrific if a diverse supply of authors had written? Great, sure. But the fact is, this is who did. And I, I just don't see how you can have any objection to or raise any flag. There's a historical thing that happened. Someone cared enough to research it and write about it effectively for young people. And it's also this history doesn't just belong to the ethnic culture, right. particularly in America. African American history is a thing, and you know, but I don't think that that things that happen in this country that involve the African American experience just belong to African Americans. It's American history. Right. It's American history. We do have lots of student questions online if you want to go to the Sure, that's terrific. Or here. Or, uh, or, 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 or I'm actually there are lots of questions. Lots of questions. Yeah. Bella, okay, so when you ask a question, please stand up and give your name, and then if you would repeat the question for our online audience. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I'm Bella, and I was very impressed by what you said, Roxanne, about the fact that you would like to be the change that you would see. You would like to see the be the change which you want to see. And that seemed very impressive to me. And uh, this was something that was also said by many other leaders, world leaders, and in my country too. And so I could I could understand what you were saying. Um, I was just wondering this, that, you know, in fact, I, I was reading about this immigrant experience and about this Korean immigrant woman who had come to America, and I was pretty impressed by, I mean, I, I, I really found the book very, uh, the story very interesting, even though it did not belong to my culture, because it was very well written, and it, it depicted the cultural identity of that, uh, of that uh, character, and it was very well written. So I was just wondering, you know, is it that, you know, to be the change that you want to see, does that need any other skills other than just being having an open mind? Or is there something that needs to be developed over time? 
So the question is, uh, in, in following on from Roxanne's uh, statement that you should be the change you want to see, does that require just an attitude of mind, or is there a kind of training or further steps that you need to take beyond that sort of inner uh, volition? Okay. I think it's really important what you're asking is, yes, I, well, I, you know, my mind is changing, but along with that, I need to learn certain skills, right? Like, how would I then change the book talks that I have that I give, right? Or do I have specific programs? Like last year, you know, because of all those infographs, I actually use the infograph with my seventh grade um, students that I see them once, um, once a month specifically for like book genre studies, you know. Um, and it's always like, you know, I have a genre and they study. And last year, um, because of the diversity training that we had in school, and one of the teachers said, we really don't read enough books by African American authors in our actual curriculum. So she, can you like, you know, shore this up? And I think if I hadn't had a real change of mind, I might have said that seemed very contrived. You know, that seemed very artificial. I might not feel that I can do it. And then last year, because I'm, I'm changing, I said yes, I'm going to take this on. We do a uh, reading groups, and I devise something because they're reading Raising the Sun in seventh grade. And so we talk about dreams and dreams deferred. So I, I then frame the entire month of looking at the books by African American authors. And it's interesting because it's actually uh, a lot of them are historical fictions that's got, gone through from like the uh, Day of Tears by Lester and all the way to uh, Brown Girl Dreaming. So we actually would let the kids presented we did it kind of timeline-wise, and say what were the dreams, how were they deferred, or how were they fulfilled, and why. So I really felt like if, if I hadn't had a change of heart, I, I possibly wouldn't have spent energy, that as much energy, um, putting together something I think will really push the kids to think certain ways. I actually challenge them and say, like, think about last three months, what have you been reading? Who are the characters? What do they look like? Um, so I, I do think that the skills need to come with it, and you know, working with other people, listening to each other, um, and think of. And um, I don't know whether you guys are watch, uh, are following uh, reading Wild White, uh, which is a new blog uh, set up by the Bank Street uh, Librarian Ali Bruce. And the first, you know, I, I, she's 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 been doing some amazing things with her little kids looking at covers, book covers, and how are um, people of color portrayed in the last decade, let's say. We are finally seeing, like I keep both holding this spot, up, you have diverse looking characters who is actually facing <coughs> with the entire face, not just, you know, the mouth or some sort of silhouette that's kind of hinting at their ethnicity. Um, so it's a very interesting trend. I, I always look at covers. I, I love examining covers. And also, even like in the past, this is a great book, right? What the Myers. But what does this black man's face tell you right under the word monster? Yeah, but right? it's Christopher. Yeah. It's Christopher's <laughs> art. I mean, I don't know. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. It, 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 it makes me think about like what are the. Oh, wait, are you saying uh, that shouldn't be the cover? No. I'm Yes, you are. I'm saying if if this is the only image, right? Oh, but that no, but right. It's not. That that's why it's important. It's not. Never going to be the only. <laughs> it is not. That's why I'm taking more than this, right? But I'm also curious about what's being represented, right? Diversity and the actual representation in the book. Um, we have teachers are starting to question in the school, like, oh, we're reading a lot of books about African American experience. Are they always the ones who suffer? So that's uh, not a question. Did, you uh, said we had some we have questions. Some online questions. Yeah, we have some online questions. So Stacy's oh. going to be our online moderator. So from Felicidim, I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, she says she has a question for Roxanne. Can you tell us the major difference between Western and Eastern children's literature? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only starting to learn. I just I went to the uh, International Ch uh, Book Fair in, in Beijing.
aging, and I focus on a lot of uh, current um, children's books in China, mostly picture books, but I didn't have time to do others. Um, but no, I really can't. I don't think that I'm, I'm an expert in that. Um, I'm going to learn, and, and maybe I will report back some other time. Sorry. I, I can um, suggest something for that person and anyone who's interested to read. At, at uh, Princeton University, there's a, a library called the Coatsen, Coatsen, C-O-T-S-E-N, uh, Center. And Minji Chen, who works there, uh, is a specialist in uh, Chinese children's literature. She wrote a piece for the Coatsen blog that I think uh, was, went, was on the blog in winter or spring of this past year, so maybe February of 2015. And if I remember, one of the things that she looked at was Chinese children, uh, Chinese picture books um, in the past 20 years or something. And I think, if I'm remembering her, her piece correctly, that she said that, that those, many of those picture books had a moral, that they were more didactic. Whereas here, you know, if a book is, is called didactic, oh, the kiss of death, but there, um, for a book to be didactic, um, makes it uh, desirable for parents. So it's kind of what you were talking about, uh, the, the philosophical. yeah, philosophical. So a um, person can Google Minji Chen, M-I-N-J-I-E, Minji Chen, C-H-E-N, and the Coatsen blog. Questions from the audience? We have another question. Um, when Roxanne and I were planning this, um, we got a couple of interesting responses from some authors, and um, a feeling of discomfort um, about how they are judged when they create characters who are not of their own race. And I, I wondered if you could address um, how authors are responding <coughs> to what we're talking about tonight, if in any way it's inhibiting creativity. Um, I was surprised by the response, but once I read it, I was really empathetic. Um, it was, there was a fear. Can I address that? Please. Yeah. Um, we've certainly heard that from, uh, and I'm talking about uh, many diverse books as a group, and also, just the online, I'm part of the YA community online on Twitter and things like that, and um, there is a fear. I mean, because uh, after Mark and I were having a bit of this conversation earlier, and I think that you should be able to write about any community, but also when you're doing that, I think you need to do no harm. That, that's the major takeaway I have, and you know, we can't always control what's being written, and there's no single story, so even if I'm writing within my community, there's going to be people who, no matter what I write, are going to say, you got that wrong, that's not me. And uh, if I'm writing about some, a community outside of my community, which I have done, there's still going to be that. So there should be a process in place uh, to, to do your due diligence when you're writing about a community. Um, for example, 10 Pretty Things in my book has three perspectives. One is African American. One is Korean American and one is uh, white American. I'm sorry? Oh, that's right. Um, and so when we were writing and editing, and even up to the stage of copy editing, since we've used some language, Korean language, in the book and stuff like that, we had readers who were from that background read it. But we also we were writing about ballet, and neither of us were professional dancers. So we had ballerinas reading the book as well, just to make sure we're not bringing errors into the world about that community when that's not our intention. We want to create the most accurate, or not accurate is the wrong word, because like I said, people are always going to think you've gotten something wrong. I think that, but you want to do the best job you can do when you're creating a presentation. And like, especially when I'm writing about my own community, I know when somebody says to me, oh, you've got it wrong, it's going to hurt, it's going to pinch. But I think it does no matter who's doing the writing. And so I think there's definitely a fear. Um, I think that some people are of the perspective that you're not allowed to write about that, which, you know, 
it's kind of unfair. Well, I think it's also but the I notion also, of whether that character that I'm writing that is a sidekick and is that a stereotype. Well, yeah, that's all. I yeah. mean, that's all, uh, long been the case for a lot of the characters that come from minority communities. And then the other um, issue is, um, can you elevate the voices that are coming out of the community as well as writing your own diverse characters? I think those are two things that are separate issues, but they also are in tandem. So that's just one perspective. And it reminds me how so much. Um, so is it okay? Yeah. Okay, so one of the things um, that I learned, you know, and I keep saying I'm learning, is about looking at things, um, you know, so societally there is the power structure, right? There is the, the majority versus the mar marginalized. Um, I'm going to invoke Michael Grant again, and he says something like, so by your definition, um, like a person of Asian descent, Right, Marie Lu can never write something like the Rose Society or the, the Young Elite, right? Because it's said in some sort of fantasy, medieval, Italian pretend society where there is actually a pretty diverse group of people, or even Echo, right? The new Pam Amunius Ryan, who wrote from three different perspectives, three different ethnic groups. Um, and I'm always wondering about that power play, right? If you are from the majority, the you, you are from the you know the more powerful group, writing to the more marginalized versus you're from a marginalized group and I can do whatever I want. Yeah, but you the know, problem is, like, but yeah. that's a poker that keeps going because, mm -hmm. for example, if I am from a Quechua-speaking South American group, the oppressive group are Hispanics. And so it, it, who gets to define a degree of marginality mm -hmm. that they get to speak and someone else doesn't? Mm -hmm. To me, what I would say is it's good that more people are speaking. It's good that more communities are speaking and if they feel offended or if they feel st that they have a voice and are heard. Mm -hmm. I think writers also have to accept not everyone's going to love what you do. I think for you guys as librarians, I think Roxanne's right. You want to be alert to all the voices. You want to be alert to the critiques and develop your own judgment. I think what some of the writers are flinching from is there is there going to be this stamp that's going to say right or wrong. And there's not going to be. There are going to be voices that express differing views. And you are going to be working in a, in a time where more communities are speaking up about what they want or see or believe, and you have to learn to negotiate that. And there's no matter what you're writing, there's going to be criticism. Yeah, because books, reading and, and, and writing, all of that, it's subjective. You know, it's, every reader brings their own experience to a book. And I, I think as long as the marginalized voices are heard, you know, the, the culture, that is being represented in that book are um, that the people from that culture are being heard, as Mark mentioned, and um, and as long as due diligence is done, you know, as long as there's research and there, and and you you find the the beta readers and you find um, you do the research and we as librarians we all know what research is about. I think that's fine, you know, and um, and I think the all the the comments that have arisen lately will make all writers, not just from the dominant culture, um, be more wary of, of what they do and um, and at least do their their job as creators as to the best of their ability. And they, they know that um, they want to be true to the characters and to the stories that are being represented in their books. So we have some more online questions. Uh, Eric asks, Janet mentioned the notable books for a global society in her presentation. What other resources do you recommend for finding more diverse books? But it's a question for the whole panel. Um, CDC uh, has a Goodreads list that they have curated and divided up amongst um, categories of diversity that um, can be very, very helpful. And then there, there are the global reading lists that uh, USBBY and IBI come up with. 
that have not just uh, books published in the United States, but books published all of, from all over the world? In um, the longer PowerPoints, I have a bunch of links in different places um, where you can find diverse books. There are a lot of great blogs out there um, in addition to many diverse books. Uh, there's the Latinos and Kidlet blog, there's the, um, the Brown Bookshelf blog, uh, a bunch of different websites that you can the, use. Um, on the American Indian and Children's mm -hmm. Literature blog, um, there's quite a few, there's so many, there's actually a lot. So, um, and of course, the American Library Association definitely offers a lot of various awards that's um, kind of reflecting diversity. Right, um, who does that? King, the Prey, um, Apala, which wow. kind of interestingly um, has Asian Pacific. Uh, which American. nobody knows about. How many of you had ever heard of the Apala uh, Awards? Oh, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four of us in, five of us in this room. You know, um, one of my books was the first. Uh, you might have been, even been on that committee. I think I was on the committee. Okay, thank you, Roxanne. So, but I didn't find out that it had that it had won until a month before the award ceremony. You know, I mean, it's just like five months passed before I even knew that it had received and, that. So I think it, that we need to disseminate um, it's also those award lists though, a little that's better. Actually, going back to one of Mark's original question, because I think about twenty something years ago we had the same discussion uh, about what diverse book awards do and what are their functions, do we need them? And it was interesting because I was actually involved in the, I guess, drafting or changing of the award criteria for Apala, which is we wanted the really good books about Asian Pacific American history and society and culture, and we didn't quite care who the creator was. That's why, um, uh, Prue's, what's her name, um, Art, um, The Heart of the Samurai. Oh, Marjorie. She, she it was honored, and there are other people, um, I think Matt Faulkner also was honored, but this year they changed the criteria. It has to be by Asian Pacific American and about Asian Pacific American. It, that not only is by, but also has to be about. So Marie Lu, with her books, reason, you know, all the output that she has, cannot win that award. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about Asian Pacific American heritage. Lambda and also changed the rules. Who? Lambda. Uh -huh. Where you had to be LBGT. Uh, it, it was, originally it was about, and it was now changed to, to so, so my soul searching on that part is maybe there is a time in history, I know you're going to disagree with me, where we're really trying to focus on growing more the number. Like we really want to make sure that there are more people of the different culture. Too. I actually don't disagree with you, except that I think you have to be clear that's an award designed to increase a writer population. It's not an award for aesthetic merit. Because if it's a merit award, you can't define who's eligible. If it's a award designed to increase the population of creators, that's different. So I think it's valid, but you have to be clear on what its validity is. We have time for two more questions, one from the audience and one online. And I also would love to know what keeps our librarians up at night about this issue. Yeah. That's a good question. Kirsty, I end up sorry, sorry. I help much. I'm not very tall. <laughs> <laughs> Kirsty, I'm, I'm hesitant to. We have this adage that we tell our children, "Walk a mile in their shoes." I'm hesitant to tell them that, and to tell them that because they're white, they can't explore an African American point of view, or an Asian point of view, or an LGBTQ point of view. I want to hear them say, "You know what? I can see myself in their shoes." and what it makes me similar to them. I want that for them, so I'm hesitant to agree with making a word only come from a particular group of people, unless, like Mark said, it's defined that way. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, Francis Bishop online. 
student says, what are some steps to build interest among teachers regarding diverse books when they are attached to books that do not reflect their student population? For the panel. <laughs> we did talk about that at dinner, and one of the problems is that teachers' hands are significantly tied. Teachers have only so much latitude. One area I think of opportunity is independent reading, not necessarily the book the whole class is reading, but in areas where teachers are promoting independent reading, we can give them new ideas and, and suggestions. And then I, I would follow that with what I said in the video, that it's really important to do read-alouds. Because very often, if you hold up a book like this, um, some kids in the classroom might say, oh, that's not for me. That, that's a book for Chinese girls. That's not for me, right? But if you, if you read aloud three pages and then say, OK, who wants to, who, who wants to borrow this book? And you pass it off. Reading it aloud might get someone to say, oh, maybe that book is for me. I'm not a Chinese girl, but maybe that book is for me. And so I think that's one of the best ways that classroom teachers can help the diverse books movement is by just scooping up a bunch, bringing them into the classroom, and reading a page of this, a page of that, a page of this out loud, and saying, OK, now it's time for independent reading. Who wants to read the book about horses? And maybe it's a book of, and maybe it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Pamela Nos Ryan, Horses, but we're not saying who wants to read the book about Hispanic people, right? We're saying who wants to read the book about horses? And then some girl who, who heard one page that she liked would say, okay, even though my grandparents are Norwegian, I, I want to read the book about horses, so I'll take that one, right? I think that's how classroom teachers could help. I, I think even though I've never been a librarian at a school, but one way that I can think of, and maybe Roxanne can let me know if this is a good idea or not, is possibly create almost like a book club with teachers and introduce them mm -hmm. <laughs> she's like, introduce them to titles that um, that they later on may want to introduce within the curriculum even if it is an add-on or part of the summer summer reading list I was just going to suggest that I, I do a monthly uh, book of teachers book club and I you know I happen to have enough budget to buy books for the teachers and they get them for free unless it's a marble speech it's very expensive so they pay a little bit for it um, but something like Harbor right that I was on Newbury and we took this as, a, as an honor book um, forgot to bring a single shot because it's the same year mm -hmm. um, and this was one of the beloved uh, books in our teachers book club and it's never made into the actual curriculum, but the teachers who have read this have been recommending it to their kids for um, the um, independent meeting. Well, but, well yeah. I, I hate yeah. to cut you off, but mm -hmm. with, a, with a marvelous recommendation, I think we've, we've come towards the end. So if everybody has a, a last comment or sentence or two to add, and then I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Todd to close the proceedings. Anybody uh, want to add a last? The thought, um, Especially everybody helps, if it helps our librarians. Too. Yes, I just want to reiterate the the power that you all have as future librarians, and the buying power that you have, and the voices that you have. So whether you find yourself at a conference or on Twitter with a publisher or an editor or someone who is a um, a gatekeeper in publishing, you know, voice your opinion and, and share that it's important that we have diverse books. I'd like to um, just say, reach out to people and push their comfort zone a little bit. So before you leave, I have some of these cards. These are pocket poems cards. They have my poem in English on one side, and then on Spanish on the other side. And I've had some people who have given these to say, oh, no, 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 I, I, don't, I, I don't need the Spanish one. And I'm all, well, it's two sides, <laughs> right? <laughs> You've got it. And, oh, but I, I don't read Spanish. Well, you know, just give it a try. You might take, take a look and see. Put, have people push, push people's comfort zones. You can do that. In the position of librarian, you can bring about a lot of change just by something as simple as handing a book or handing a, a poem card to somebody. Um, I think establishing relationships is really important. When I was a teacher, I only knew of one conference, NCTE, because I was an English teacher. Um, and I never went. 
as a teacher. Um, now, in, in, in house as an editor, I know about ALA, Midwinter, Annual, IRA. I go to all of them. Um, and it's like, oh, like, oh my god, how did I not know this existed as a teacher? Uh, it's the same reason that I didn't get um, courses in children's books as a teacher. There's just a, a lack in um, that part of uh, the education of people who are going to be working with children. And some of my most valuable relationships right now are with teachers and librarians that I've met at these various conferences and we keep in touch and they, I send them galleys and they send me feedback, not only their feedback, but they, they like the book, they'll give it to their kids and so I sometimes hear direct from kids what they thought of the book and it does inform how I shape the book, it informs my acquisition process and that is, and editors love to be in contact with teachers and librarians and that is a way that you can really affect change without being necessarily in-house. And I was thinking, like, these are none of this is in, in vacuum. Um, I think part of my my awakening for myself is there's so much going on in the world, right? In our country, in the world, and and th this cannot exist just solitary on their own, and we don't exist in vacuum. So what what I think we need to do as librarians is to not just think about the little things that we do on a daily basis, but think a little bit larger, think about the big picture that's out there and how these actually will change the world. Um, and, and just think a little bigger. Um, I think that will be, it'll make you happier too, in some way. <laughs> you're really changing the world. <laughs> First of all, please give a wonderful round of applause. I'm going to be very quick, but first, um, many I think know who I am. I'm Russ Todd, Chair of the Library and Information Science Department. I want to, of course, welcome our online students as well as our on-campus students. We have some of our wonderful alum here tonight as graduates of our program. What a joy to hear each of you. Thank you very, very much. What I think our panel has modeled is that we here at Rutgers and you as uh, uh, budding librarians should not be afraid of the debate, of the, de the issues and the diversity of viewpoints that swirl around these complex and vitally important arenas and our panel, you were just wonderful models of that rich diversity which is at the center of our conversation tonight. Just in closing, um, I love coming to these colloquiums for that very, very reason. But I just want to say and to build on the remarks of one of you on the panel, uh, to our students in particular, the power that you have and to understand the power that you have and first and foremost, that comes from a deep knowing of your kids. Get to know your kids in rich and diverse and multiple ways. Honour and value who they are. The lives that they live, the young experiences that they have, and you see the real challenge that I think everyone on the panel gave us tonight was to engage them in a journey, a diverse journey of living and learning and understanding what life is all about. That challenge is to, and here is the power, that challenge is to transport them to other worlds to the multiple worlds that they will grow up in and live and learn in because it's about understanding self. One of the other challenges comes, I think, and this was such a beautiful undercurrent in the ideas that were, were present, the challenge is to us, is to really consider what we privilege as reading. 
And actually, what we should be privileging is that kids are reading and understanding what they are reading and celebrating what they're reading. I don't actually care what it is. <laughs> because I want us to honour that they are reading in the diverse, rich, multiply, wonderful information forms that they engage in. And just to finish up, you see, I deeply believe that libraries are the cradle of civilization. Hold those kids in your intellectual hands and give them the world. Libraries are the window to the world. And that was the message that I took away tonight. You have power because your libraries are that cradle of civilization. Let's honor it, celebrate it, and thank our panel for a wonderful evening. Thank you. This is our last colloquium of this semester, and I'm going to ask somebody here who is passionate about this subject to give us a takeaway in a minute, so I want you to, to start thinking. But across our colloquia, we've been talking about your responsibility in terms of social justice. And your response to our panel tonight is going to make a difference in the lives of many children. And so what does this mean? What does it mean when the teachers are too busy to address diversity in children's and young adult literature, to share with children options that they may not have discovered? This stuff is on you. And I know that the students who are here today, our alumni, the students who are online, also with us are going to take subjects like this seriously because this is one banner that we wave and very few other people wave in, in the face of children. So it's critically important. And I want to thank everybody who came of their own volition, gave us their valuable professional time at, in the evening. And, 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 and it's just been, I'm so grateful that you decided to join us with your wisdom and your artistry and your passion. So um, thank you, my panel, our panel. Um, any final thoughts, inspiration from our, from our students? It's always <coughs> risky. I just have one. You do, Dr. Todd. <laughs> you know, part of the, not a strong part of the conversation was engaging our kids as creative mm. Kids as all. And I think that's a talent and an opportunity um, that we can lead. Why aren't our libraries centers for kids self-publishing? Let's do it. Yes. Dr. Todd was echoing the notion that some of our panelists shared um, that this is about students and their creativity and that uh, these, these, this provides opportunities for our children's voices to be heard as well. And I see lots of opportunities for all sorts of technology to inspire discovery of materials as well. Uh, that's just my personal button. If, uh, any final comments? If not, um, thank you all for coming tonight. And feel free to Yes, it went well. Just real quickly, I wanted to uh, make sure that we uh, get uh, registered the fact that RU Libraries gives us the space for free. So thank you, RU Libraries, to our online students. It has been great. I'll see your reflections online to our on-campus students. Uh, I'll see you guys uh, uh, in your reflections online. And again, thanks for a really wonderful colloquium this semester. And uh, we'll be here next semester, too. And you're always welcome. So thanks again, and stay